So tonight we are going to uh, talk to Dr. Ryan White um, from the uh, uh, Department of Mathematics at the Florida Institute of Technology. He's also a principal in his own practice, uh, White Associates, and a senior advisor in the data science to nonprofit uh, Engage AI. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about uh, beyond computer vision and classification. And uh, really, uh, I, I'm excited to hear the topic. Uh, computer vision is the field I'm currently immersed in heavily. So I will, uh, I, I want to learn a whole bunch. I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. White. So uh, thanks for coming, everyone. I'm Ryan White. I'm, uh, as I guess I don't need to say what I am because Chris just said it, but um, I'm a professor, researcher, do things on the side. Uh, what I wanted to talk about is, is computer vision um, beyond the simple image classification problem. So I, I'm aware that, you know, that I'm not entirely sure what, what the audience looks like. So um, I, I wanted to start without being too technical at all and maybe steadily boil the frog and make everyone uncomfortable <laughs> toward the end. Um, if you see people dropping off, you'll know you got to the correct level. Is that, is that exactly. Yeah. Uh, just, just like teaching a class. Yeah. Uh, well, there we go. So my background, I grew up in Logan, West Virginia. That's the entire city there. Um, this is my elementary school. This is my middle school. And this is my high school in, wow. <laughs> across the street from each other. So that's about as far as I went up until about 2005. Um, I was super into math. Not a lot of other people were super into math with me, other than some of my teachers. Um, so I moved to Florida in 2009 to, to go to grad school in, in, in math. Uh, part of my interest in, uh, you know, AI and technology started with a problem of me not being able to drive a car. So I'm a wheelchair user since 2009. I have muscular dystrophy, um, and also I'm flexing the flamethrower. But don't don't worry about that. Anyway, my interest here started that you know I was like I'm going to make the self-driving car because I can't get a car that I can drive, and this is crazy. Well, I solved that problem a little bit earlier. Um, you know, got a van with a ramp in it, and on the right, you can see me driving with, with my hands. But initially, I did a lot of just looking at what people were doing with self-driving cars and, and the computer vision required to avoid the cars from crashing into each other and, and so on, which we're progressing on, but we're there. I uh, know Tesla's currently under investigation at the moment, but um, here's my, my path. So I, you know, went to school, uh, Shadron State College in Nebraska. I got an online, I, I went to a program online at the time. I didn't have a wheelchair, didn't have all that figured out. So 2009, went to Florida Tech. Um, that's our beautiful campus with the palm trees everywhere. So started there as an assistant professor 2019. And, uh, 2020, I started working with a uh, nonprofit Engage AI with uh, some AI related stuff associated with um, global development. So that's where I am. That's kind of my <laughs> short story of my path. Um, so to jump into this uh, main problem I see in a lot of things is that people say the word AI and they don't explain what they mean. Often they mean nothing because they're, not, you know, it's kind of became a buzzword, but it's kind of an umbrella term just for any kind of machine that tries to do some human-like activity. Um, machine learning is traditionally defined as a subset of that, uh, which is, you know, algorithms that use math and statistics to try to learn from looking at data in some sense. And deep learning, the thing I'd like to talk about uh, mostly is a, very, is a subset of that. Um, it's a many layered uh, neural networks that learn from data. So these are models that are, are, they were originally built to try to model how the brain works. That's not, it doesn't really work that way, but they learned that it, it was still useful. <laughs> so even back in, they actually started this in the forties. You can see here, uh, this is kind of the timeline. Uh, again, let me say at the start here, a lot of these pictures are not at all my own pictures. It, I didn't have a chance to write all the citations, but let me know if, if you want to know where anything came from. Uh, anyway, so in the 50s, 60s, 70s, people were started rattling about AI. There were computers, um, but it was very narrow, wasn't, didn't really take off. Uh, machine learning became popular, 90s. 
uh, 2000s. Deep learning, I, I, I'm not happy with where that deep learning circle is. I want it to be back a little bit further in time, but uh, these neural networks came out. 2010, really, the thing that changed there is that people started using uh, graphics processing units for the computing, and it, it really took off with, with uh, what these models are. So I want to briefly explain you know, more about what these models are. So let's start with biology. Keeping in mind, this is a mathematician trying to explain biology who doesn't know very much. But anyway, in very simplified terms, uh, the way the nervous system works, it's made up of neurons, neural cells. Um, so they receive electrical impulses that are ultimately usually from some kind of external stimulus. And based on the type of signal they get, um, neurons typically will excite and start firing more or be, become inhibited and start firing less. And then those signals go on to other neurons and the signal is sent essentially through the nervous system. There's a whole lot more to it than that, but that's enough to understand what people were doing when they came up with artificial neurons and why they thought it was an idea that made sense. So we can see here uh, a picture of a biological neuron and an artificial neuron. So the biological one up there um, is, you know, it has all these different parts. Um, and then in the artificial case, this comes from the, the 40s, McCulloch and Pitts, they were Pitt psychologists actually. Um, they come up with a model where they would send in some kind of signal, which would be made up of these x values, x0, x1, x2. So it would be a, some kind of piece of data that, that involves three numbers. And then they have these numbers, w1, w2, and w0. These are weights. And these are things that they would try to customize, customize the values of these weights so that when they went and did this calculation in the quote unquote cell body and then passed it through a, a function, it would give us an output that we'd like to have. So the very early things that they tried to do, they would try to pass, you know, an and logical function to it, which would just be like a binary one, one, and they'd pass one, one to it. And then they'd try to see if the thing should be true or not, uh, depending on the signal that, that you sent. So that's how it started out. Um, and so a very simple example of this uh, is called linear regression where um, this is exactly what people do when they do best fit lines. So you pass in a couple of numbers and there's a numerical output that you expect to get. And so basically you try to learn this function f, which just means to figure out what this weight, what these weights should be, so this number b, so that the output is equal to what we hope it for it to be. So with just one neuron, uh, we get this linear regression. And that's how we do best fit lines and all this. It's not people divine figured out how to do best fit lines in the 1800s, but you can put it into this structure and it totally works. Uh, in this case, it would be a, a three dimensional problem rather than two. But same kind of idea. So this existed already. This is a very commonly used thing. Linear regression is one of the most popular statistical methods that people use, and it really involves just one of these artificial neurons. Now. To get closer to what people do with neural networks these days, um, they would have what's called logistic regression. And what it tries to do, it tries to take an input data point again, and it tries to predict zero or one in some sense. So, so in the case that everyone uses um, in computer vision, you might try to feed a picture of a cat into the computer and have the computer tell me it's a cat. If I feed a dog into the computer, I might want it to tell me it's a dog. So I might define a cat as zero and a dog as one. And so depending on what my input data looks like, the output should be a zero or a one. Um, so the one thing that's different from linear regression is that we've added this little piece here. Um, and this is called an activation function. And in particular, it's the, the sigmoid activation function. I think I have a, a picture. But it, it's something that kind of smoothly goes from 0 to 1. The, the point of that is that you can have something that's like, we're like, we can be like 80% sure it's a cat, or we can be 20% sure it's a cat, or something like that, rather than just outputting a 0 or a 1. 
Um, and the benefit of this is that what that allows us to do is to actually feed in one data point and see what we get and see how bad it was. Did we did it select the right thing or the wrong thing? And based on that, we, we can actually work, work the math backwards and figure out what happens if I manipulate this W2 a little bit. If I make W2 just slightly bigger, do I get uh, something closer to the right answer or further from the right answer? Oh, sorry. Um, and so there, there are some algorithms. Um, gradient descent is, is one that, that can tell you how I should nudge this little number so that it is more likely to predict that a cat is a cat. Same thing with the W1. Now in a real model, they're gonna stack up tons and tons and tons of these neurons uh, that will uh, you know, make it actually useful. Um, but I wanted to start here just to show that there is use, there are useful things you can do with a single neuron. Uh, and here, here's one example. This is just something I ran. Uh, there's a famous data set from the University of Wisconsin on breast cancer classification. And so they have uh, a lot of breast cells that they have um, you know, taken images of and captured a lot of information about them, mostly geometric stuff like uh, you know, what's the radius of the cell, what's the texture, what's the perimeter, what's the area of smoothness, dot, dot, dot. About 10 pieces of information. And then they label them as either uh, malignant or benign. So these are, this is a data set that's, you know, it's already labeled. We know which ones are malignant, which ones are benign, and we know all of this geometric data about them. So you can use logistic regression pretty much exactly like this. Just instead of having two of these inputs, there would be 10 because the breast cancer data set has 10 features, all numerical. And you can use this single neuron uh, logistic regression. Uh, well, you know, a bunch of inputs, but a single neuron. And you can get a 98% accuracy in predicting these numbers, that, even from data points the model's never seen before. So up here, we have a training classification report. So what that is, we feed in a bunch of points, a bunch of these breast cell data points, where we know what the output's supposed to be. And we run it through an algorithm, uh, backpropagation is what it's called, to figure out how to adjust all of those little weights to, to get the predictions that we want. So on this training set, which is data that the model is looking at as it learns, um, we can actually get a 98% accuracy on uh, classifying it as, as, um, you know, as benign or malignant. Uh, then the uh, testing data, this is data the model has never seen before. So we take this training data look at it and let the model adjust itself so that it predicts it very well. And then we take a totally new data set of data, the test data, and let it run on that and see how it does. So this helps us avoid cheating because uh, there, there's a problem called overfitting where, where if you make a big enough model, it'll kind of just memorize the data, but that's not really learning if, it, if it's not able to generalize to new data points it's never seen before. So that's the point of, of breaking it into training and testing. So my point here is that even though logistic regression is tiny, that there's one uh, you know, working neuron, you can do real, you can solve real problems with it. Um, if you look at um, like Kaggle that has these competitions, <laughs> it's surprising, like some of them are actually won by logistic regression, which is crazy because they're much, much more complicated models, but you know, sometimes they're just unnecessary. Um, so this brings us to the idea of a neural network, which is a network of these neurons. So you have the inputs, and then you have all the neurons in green here. This is called a hidden layer. And then the output that is you know, what it actually predicts. So when people talk about deep learning, what they're talking about is how many layers the thing has in it. So if there are more of these hidden layers, which are neurons, it's deeper. Um, so that, that's, just, that's all people mean by deep learning. Um, so what I'd like to do is show you that um, for a more interesting set of data, um, if we stack up a bunch of these neurons, we can do a good bit better. Um, so one very, very com common benchmark for um, image classification is uh, classifying handwritten digits. So uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, I think, is a 
you know, US department that um, captured a huge data set called MNIST that has um, a bunch of images of handwritten characters, uh, zero to nine. And for each one, they have 70,000 pictures. These are, this is data that they collected from, half of it came from US Postal Service workers and half of it came from high school students. Don't know why, but <laughs> that's, that's where it came from. Uh, that's the data they had access to. And so initially people were like, well, it would be really cool if we could train a computer to look at a bunch of numbers and figure out what the numbers are. The postal service wanted to do this because they didn't want to have to sort the mail by hand. Mm -hmm. People wrote the zip codes on there. They'd like the computer to automatically read the zip code and then automatically send it to where it needs to go without as much you know, human intervention. So if we want to think about computer vision on the left here, this is what we see when we see a, a picture of a handwritten digit, it's a little pixelated, but you know, that's the quality of the, the images that they use. They're, they're 28 by 28 pixels. And then what the computer sees is over here. So each of these numbers represents one pixel in this picture. And so as you can see, the ones that have larger numbers are correspond to where the darker marks are in the image. So when I, want to feed this image to a computer, what the computer is going to see is this thing on the right. So this is uh, 28 rows, 28 columns. Uh, multiply those together, that's 700 and something different pixels. So what that means is that our data has 700 and however many dimensions. That's how many numbers we need to represent this picture. This is black and white. If you have color pictures, you'll have, you know, a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel, but same idea. Um, <laughs> this is a picture from three brown, one blue. I don't know if you know this YouTube channel, but he is incredible. So uh, yeah, okay, so 784 is how many pixels there are there. Um, so what you would do, you'd take, for example, a picture of the number seven, and your first input layer would have 784 inputs. There's a dot, dot, dot here, because we can't draw that many on the screen. <laughs> Um, and then what I'm going to do is have 10 outputs. And each, each one corresponds to one of the possible things that the digit could have been. So in an ideal situation, we'll feed in our pixel values for the seven, the, the more colored it is, the closer it is to one. And then the output ideally will be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. So wherever the, the thing that we want it to classify as, that's what we want it to output. Uh, so we have a model that will have 784 plus one weights, because there's something called a bias that, that's involved. Um, 10 neurons, one for each digit, and then the 10 in the out, 10 output uh, units there. So that's, a relatively small neural network. This is something that you could run in 1986 on a pretty good computer. So if you run logistic regression, which is basically a tiny neural network with, with only that one hidden layer, you can see here that here we, we do quite well. Uh, we can do get 94% of the data right um, on the training data, the data that we're feeding to the model that it's allowed to look at. And then we don't lose much when we convert over to data it's never seen before. So over here, we had 60,000 images that it's trained on, 10,000 images that it's tested on, and our accuracy drops by 1% down to 93%. But um, so my point is, is just that it's, even these really tiny neural networks are quite strong. Um, now, my students, joked last semester with uh, my neural networks class that it became the MNIST class because I started with this model and then I went, okay, let's look at a bigger model and put this data in it and it would go up to like 95%. Then we put it in a more modern convolutional neural network and it gave us like 98%. And eventually you can get it up over 99%. It's a solved problem, but but it's it's just a great one to, to start with, I think, to understand how all this is working. Uh, so I should have put this before, I guess, but you know, this is an animation of how the data feeds through there. But if we zoom in on just one little block, uh, neuron here, so what's happening is that we are, we've got all these uh, connections to it, 784 connections. And inside this neuron, what it does, it 
each of those connections has a weight. It multiplies the weights by the input signal and feeds it into that sigmoid function. That's all it does. And if you have more layers, it just does the same thing more times until we get you know, our, our output. So ideally, this is what happens. More likely what happens is something like this, where we feed in the image of the three and we, <laughs> we get some output that's, that's terrible. It, it's not, nothing like we want. We, we'd like to have 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And so you can see here, um, this is what we want and this is what we got. So what we can actually do is just make a calculation for how wrong we are. Usually you can do like, you know, the difference in the activation here and the activation here squared plus the difference here squared and, and so on. Let's add up the sum of squares. But there are lots of other ways that people do it, but, but you can calculate how wrong you are in a sense. And you can calculate it in a formula that allows us to work backwards through the network to see how the error reacts if we adjust each of these tiny weights. So I think this neural network has about 14,000 weights, which sounds like a lot, but you know, it's, it's small compared to modern stuff. So this is a scary looking picture, but let me explain it like a human. <laughs> so what we do, we, um, we have our model that we start out with. Usually we just randomly initialize it, randomly decide on those weights. Uh, we feed a bunch of our input images through it. Uh, we calculate our loss function. This is, you know, if we take all these inputs, push them through, see how bad the error is, add up all those errors. This is our step three. Um, and then uh, if anyone remembers calculus or would like to talk about calculus, uh, we, we actually take the derivative of the error function with respect to each of those little weights. Um, if, if you remember, if you've taken calculus one, it's like the chain rule. There's some kind of terrible memory that anyone has that um, lets you sort of take apart these functions and work them backwards to get all those derivatives. And so this back propagation is the shortcut that makes this actually numerically feasible. Otherwise it's way too slow. That came out in the eighties. Before that neural networks were kind of terrible because they were way too slow to train. Um, and then based on that, we update our weights and then we just do it all over again. So we pass the stuff through, see how much error we got. Um, then figure out how do we adjust all the little parameters in the model adjust them a little bit, pass all the stuff through again, and it just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And eventually, usually the, the error will level off somewhere. It, it might be a, still a bad error, but, but hopefully it'll be pretty good. So next problem, after everyone solved MNIST, uh, people were like, well, let's, let's make a problem that's impossible for anyone to ever solve with a computer. So the ImageNet large scale visual recognition challenge. This was a conference that they had yearly. Uh, Fifi Lee from now of Stanford uh, was, was involved there. So they took uh, 1.4 million images and they come from a thousand different classes. So this is a bunch of examples of what they look like. So you have pictures of mammals, placentals, carnivores, work, uh, huskies, you know, sailboats. This is just a tiny subset. There, there are you know, a thousand different objects that they have in the different images. And said, well, if we can recognize handwritten digits, let's see what's the best we can do on recognizing these things that are much, much more difficult to, to figure out what they are. Because if I have like a picture of a truck, I can imagine so many different trucks. They could be different colors. I could be looking at different angles. Uh, you know, I could have, parts of them blocked, they could be, you know, big or small in the, in the frame. So people are pretty much like, well, this is, seems pretty impossible. So let's just make it a challenge and we'll compete on it every year. So they competed every year um, from, I think it started around 2008, if I'm not wrong. And uh, here's kind of where we started. I guess 2010 is maybe the first year. So there they um, had an error rate of 28%. So not bad, honestly, Th thinking about how hard of a problem it is to try to 
pick, pick out a thousand different objects that can be in all different angles, different colors, different sizes, different shapes. Um, that happened um, next year, 25.8. If you have, if we had the graph going back further, I think you would see that it was like slow, very, very, very slowly shrinking. Uh, 2012, Alex Net. This is Alex Krzyzewski from, from, not sure where he is now, but he was a student at Stanford when he when they published it. Uh, so they dropped the error rate down all the way to 16%. Uh, Zyler and Fergus they dropped it to 11.7, and you can see everything got much 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 better really 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 quickly. So VGG Net, the folks from from Oxford got down to 7.3%. Folks from Google got to 6.7. Uh, Kaiming He and some others um, with ResNet got down to 3.57. And over here, we can see humans were only able to do it with about a 5.1% error rate. So what happened was kind of funny. They, they said, well, we beat humans, so we don't need to have this competition anymore. And they, they, they canceled it. Um, now, it, it still went on. For, I think it still does even, but it, it's not like a conference that people go to. But all the top people in the world were really doing this. But you know, what I'd like to think about is what happened? Why? Why all of a sudden in 2012 were we able to just kill this problem so quick? Um, so one thing we talked about depth, which is the number of, of layers in the models. This is this is tricky. We've reversed it. So this is 2010, 2011, 2012, and so on. So here was the error rates, the blue bars, and this orange one. This is what happens with the number of layers in the model. So 2010, 2011, they had you know, two layers, I think. Uh, eight layers here, eight here, 19, 22, 152. So again, something else blew up. And so what really happened was in 2012, what was important about AlexNet, they started using GPUs, which everyone thought was for gamers. But um, turns out um, they're really good at doing this stuff. Because if we go back to what all these neurons are doing, each one, all it's doing is multiplying some stuff, adding it up, and putting it through this function. It's just that we do it, you know, 14,000 times. <laughs> so, but the point is, all of the math that's being done is really easy to do, really cheap on a computer. So, what GPUs allow people to do was to extremely parallelize their calculations. We'll get back to that, but, but I mean, there are a lot of other factors that we're going in. Things, stories that we know, you know, what does a dollar of computing power do from 1980 to 2010? You know, this is, if you look, this is a log scale. So, you know, we had a growth rate for, that went from 10 to 100 million, you know, in 30 years. And, you know, what we could get for the money in computing, uh, gigabyte, dollar per gigabyte of storage, of course, same thing. 10 cents per gigabyte in 2010, that's expensive right now. At least if you're doing hard disk drives. Uh, you know, 1980, that costs a million dollars. So, you know, that's helping us. And then this is the, the comparison of GPU computing versus CPU computing up to 2014. These are a little outdated, but the, the, the trend has continued. These are the GeForce series uh, GPUs from, from NVIDIA. Uh, so why GPUs? Again, it's because CPUs, they can have multiple cores, but we're really limited to how many they are, and that's kind of how many parallel things they can do. Um, GPUs, the cores of GPUs aren't the same as the cores of CPUs, but each core of a GPU, they call them tensor cores with, with NVIDIA, and there's a number of other names. Um, they can You can break them up into much smaller pieces, and you get like a whole army of tiny computers doing tiny calculations, which is perfect for neural networks because we have, you know, possibly millions of tiny neurons doing tiny bits of calculation. So if you can parallelize it extremely, then uh, it, it, you know, it sent the, our capabilities of how big we could make these models through the roof. NVIDIA has the CUDA library that, that does a lot of this work. This is the top of the line right now, our, well, consumer line, at least RTX 3090. They're impossible to buy at the moment because uh, the shortage of raw materials and everyone's buying them to mine Bitcoin and whatever else. But 
anyway. Uh, so, you know, that, that's working for us too. One last thing, there are lots of innovations in the way the neural, the neural networks behave. So the, these are called fully connected networks like we've seen before. Later, uh, people started doing, doing it in such a way where the neurons weren't all connected to each other. There's a much fewer connections. Um, and this is a, a, you know, a model called a, a convolutional neural network. I don't wanna go into the details there, but um, they perform way better on image classification. So uh, with that, uh, this is where we are. Um, this is, you know, they've gotten way better. Here are several of the reasons why. So I wanted to take a little step away and talk a little bit about a problem that I've been working on just through my research. Um, this is a quote from uh, a guy from DARPA, uh, Defense Something Agency. <laughs> Sorry, not sure what that stands for, but um, we've been working on the problem of like, dysfunctional or old satellites that are in orbit. So uh, this guy's quote says, there's no other area in human activity where we build something that's worth half a billion dollars, like a satellite or billion dollars, and we use it. We uh, then just never look at it again, never fix it, never upgrade it. They're mostly, they're pretty much disposables. Um, something I learned that's, that's awesome is that sometimes when they run out of fuel, what they do, they just like use the last bit of fuel to like launch themselves a little bit farther out into orbit and they call it the satellite graveyard. So they just put it out into a farther out orbit and let it go around so that it doesn't hit anything or whatever. So what we're trying to do is, is trying to facilitate the ability to go in and fix these things. Now it's very dangerous to send humans, very expensive. So what we'd like to do is send, uh, Tiny, dro tiny drones or tiny satellites. This is an artist rendering, obviously, but what we'd like to do is be able to send this uh, theoretical chaser satellite, let it go attached to a satellite that's there and do some work on it. You know, the work could be as simple as, you know, let's upgrade the RAM on this thing. Let's do, put some new software on it. Let's, you know, give it some more fuel or let's just repair something that's broken on it. Now, problem is, um, if you try to control these things from the ground, it, there's a big lag time, and it's it's really hard to do any kind of precision control to like take these chase satellites, let them attach onto uh, satellites in orbit. So, what we want to try to do is build a guidance system, navigation system that can do this autonomously. One, because it it's dangerous for humans to do it, and two, it's expensive to do it, you know, in real time with, with a human pilot. So what we started with, uh, this is something funded by the, the U.S. Space Force with some of my uh, colleagues here at Florida Tech, uh, which <laughs> Space Force is a thing. It is getting funding, although they, they are within the Air Force Research Lab because they, they're fighting over who gets to keep what. So we'll, we'll see where that goes, but whatever. So we started with image classification, just like we saw before. Um, we started with a bunch of different types of components, uh, spacecraft, uh, really the body of the spacecraft, uh, determining if there's a meteoroid, nozzle, fuel tank, solar panels. Because one question is, you know, if there's an unknown satellite, how do I know what type, you know, what I'm looking at, what, what, what these different pieces on it might be? So what we did, we, we collected a bunch of data, uh, pictures of each of these types of objects. It's like, well, let's train a neural network, see if we can identify which one's which based on the pictures. Uh, so we used what's called DGGNet. That, that was the one that, that was from 2015. Uh, it has these convolutional layers and, and fully connected layers only at the end. So that's like the old school neural network in blue. The new stuff is, is over here. And uh, softmax is kind of just like that uh, activation, fun, that smoothing function we talked about. So this model has 138 million weights because it has this many layers. Um, so, but it turns out like I can train this on my desktop with a, you know, with a, I think it was like a generation back NVIDIA GPU. Um, so we tried a bunch of different architectures and what we found, uh, this one was terrible. We just went and looked online and see what's doing the best of these types of problems just to have a place to start. 
And finally, we took BGG-19, which is like the one we just showed, but, but a little bit bigger. And in uh, tan here, these are the ones that are classified correctly. And the other values are errors. So what we had, we had 94% accuracy on a test set here of 125 images based on a training set of 875 images. So it worked pretty good. Um, then we've got a lab here to, to, and a bunch of toys to kind of play with. So we have what is essentially a toy satellite. It, it's literally made out of cardboard and foil and stuff. It's like, like a kid made it. But um, what we did to just see if our thing was useful in the real world, um, we just trimmed all of our frames down to the same size, standardized the, the uh, data. And so we took some pictures that were that only displayed one object. We were only looking at solar panels and nozzles. So, so here you can see the solar panels with the nozzle on the back. You can't see over here. You can see the nozzle on the back, but not the solar panels. So we tried to pick pictures that had only one object just to feed it in and see if our model is any good. So we fed in just some pictures from the lab. Uh, we not very many. <laughs> Obviously, we had you know eleven images because this was expensive to do. Uh, and no, they were all correct. Um, we didn't train on the data. We just took our other training stuff and, and did that. So this works, um, but this isn't useful. I, I don't need to know if there's just one object, what is it? Uh, when I have a camera feed looking at a satellite, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff. So famous picture from uh, Stanford's uh, computer vision course. So image classification is what we were doing. We get a picture of a cat and the computer says it's a cat. Cool. We did we do that well. But a better thing to try to do is try to locate where is the cat and locate if there's other kinds of issues, can I find those different things in the picture? So here we would find boxes around the cats, boxes around dogs, boxes around the ducks, and the computer would be able to tell in that box what's in there. So that, that's an object detection problem. So that's, that was our next step, because what we want to be able to do is take a camera feed on this autonomous satellite, let it look at what it's approaching, and see where are the solar panels, where are the antennas, where are the, where's the body of the satellite. So the antennas and the solar panels are really easy to break, so you want to stay away from those. And if you can figure out where exactly the other objects are, you can kind of aim toward those. So the thrusters and the satellite body, these are things that we think that we can grip onto with a chaser satellite. These satellites that are up there dead, they, they're not designed to be gripped onto. So it's, it's a hard problem to figure out where do I dock with it. So we looked around for different algorithms. Uh, this is a kind of complicated diagram, but horizontally, we have the time that it takes to make a prediction, the algorithm. And vertically, this is the error on a very popular data set called COCO. I believe it's from Microsoft. And what you see is this one over here, YOLO v3, is um, way far to the left of everything else. It's a little bit worse. It's a little bit lower. So the, the accuracy is not as good, but it's way faster. And what we said, this is, it stands for you only look once. It's the fastest object detector that's particularly good right now. Um, and it's ideal with the weak type of onboard computers we could have on one of these chaser satellites. So we're restricted probably to having something kind of like a Raspberry Pi, um, even like a, I mean, we can use a, I think right now we're using a, a, a tiny GPU that, that's based on the USB that you just stick in it. But um, that's the type of computing power we're limited to because you can't use much power draw in space because it's very expensive to send it up there and we don't, we don't want to deal with the weight. So I even tried to say, well, let's use an NVIDIA Jetson. It's, it's, a, it's a lot faster than, than this compute stick that we have. But what the engineers that I'm working with told me is like, look, the power draw is about 10 times as much. So no good. So we had to choose something that runs fast. Um, so this is what the data looks like that you capture. So we have solar rays, thrusters, antennas, and satellite bodies. So we have a bunch of images and we had to not only say what's in the image, but where exactly is it? And there might be multiple things in the image. So this is what our data set looks like. We, we captured that many, mostly from harvesting Google image, images, honestly. Um, so this is you know some of the real data. Some of these aren't even real. Some of these are cartoons, but they're close enough that, that they're useful. 
So the thing that we have to predict is, you know, we need to figure out a box for the object that we're looking for. So we have to predict the center of the box, how wide the box is, how high the box is, what's in it, and are we sure there's something there? So the labels here will look something like this. This is the kind of thing we'd try to predict. One, there's an object, 220, 190, that's the dimension, the uh, location of the center, and the width, the height. And then this is what our MNIST thing was predicting, uh, a binary vector. So if we had maybe cat, dog, bird, and tiger, uh, you know, one of this one here would represent bird, and that's what we would want to predict. So that would be the label. So not much changes mathematically. We're just predicting this much, you know, bigger thing than, than just predicting the class. So how yellow works, it breaks the thing into uh, a grid. It finds boxes the best it can. It does what's called non-max suppression to try to find the best box. And down here, um, each little square there, we try to see, we let the classifier part run on it and see what it thinks is in that box. And then you combine, you know, find the good box and find, you know, what seems to be common in that box and then try to find it. So here we, we found a dog, a bike, and a truck. So that's briefly how, how YOLO works. So these are some of the examples on our data. Um, so we were able to find that this was a CubeSat, or, or at least a satellite body. And then even within there, we find these solar panels. Over here is a cool one. We have an antenna, which is this round thing. Then we have solar panels. But there's actually an arm here that's blocking part of it, but it still finds it using this, this YOLO. Um, so we needed, again, so <laughs> problem again we're being we're doing too easy of a problem we're looking at steel images we need videos so my student said let's just use Kerbal space program and I'm like in my head I, I was saying this is not going to work but out of my mouth said yeah yeah go go for it so my, <laughs> my student went and captured a video from there and uh, just ran our model on it and so what you can see here is this is a video game but in this video, it's doing pretty good of finding the solar panels, finding the body, uh, finding the antenna. So a good case of, you know, keeping your mouth shut is, is, is nice, <laughs> especially with, you know, people that are trying things. Yeah, go you've try just, you, You've just taken Kerbal to the next level for me, by the way. Yeah. Very nice, very nice. <laughs> that was our idea. Then we were like, okay, let's get something real because <laughs> these military people are gonna laugh at us. But so uh, this is our lab. Uh, this is where we put our satellite. We can rotate it around. We put our camera on this little plate. We can move it around on this thing. We captured a, a, a you know, more real video. This is our amazing grad student, Trupti. Uh, there we go. So that's what it looks like. This is actually kind of a bad video, but I think the file is too big to run <laughs> inside PowerPoint. But anyway, this satellite, this fake satellite can be rotated in several angles and then our camera can approach it and we see what we're doing. Uh, so we ran our model here. Let's see if this one runs. This was a, our first low light test, so it's not very good, honestly, but, uh, but you can see uh, it's finding the solar panel, it's finding the body. It's, it's locating what objects are. It's not doing super great at determining what it is. Down here, it sees something that looks like a straight line, so it thinks that's an antenna, but you know, some of this stuff makes sense. But so this was our first try to get it to work on video. And around here, it's pretty decent, but you know, the light conditions are, are pretty hard. So it works pretty well, but you know, there's a lot of work to go. Uh, so future plans, we're going to test on some of these this cheap hardware, um, not with a wire on it, obviously, but do that. And we're going to like strap it to a drone, see if we can land on the thing just for, you know, to play with. And then part of our commitment to the Space Force is to figure out some flight path plan planning and guidance and navigation to try to do some docking. Uh, also, we got this cool uh, RealSense uh, camera that captures RGB, but also the depth. So it's pretty good at capturing how far things are from the camera. So we've been trying to see what we can do with that to, to exploit that depth to do a little bit better job. 
I have way too many slides, so <laughs> we'll get through however many <laughs> that's, that, that we'll get through. Um, so my other problem, uh, so a totally different thing from this uh, object detection. What's happening? Uh, our next problem is to try to model the flow of glaciers. They're moving over time. Oh, this picture is not working. Well, I had a video, but here we go. So this is uh, the recession of a glacier, the top of a glacier. Um, so 1850s, it, it filled this whole region. 1832, uh, it had a boundary around here. 56 was here, 88 was here, 2002 is there. So you can see that it, over time it's receding backwards. So what we'd like to try to do is figure this out from satellite imagery. Uh, so in case we haven't tortured ourselves enough, let's look for something even harder. So we can do classification, uh, this localization, we can do object detection. Even harder is image segmentation, which is not only do I need to know where these things are, I need to predict the whole box that surrounds them, which is again, really hard. But if we wanna to try to measure how these glaciers are moving over time, how their geometry is changing, uh, we, that's what we need to be able to do to find that boundary, find the outline of it. So the questions are, you know, which ones are changing? How fast are they changing? Uh, how exactly are they changing? And if there's 10,000 plus glaciers, how do we do this as a human? Obviously we can't do it uh, manually. So we're trying to, you know, train a model here. So this is the kind of data that we've got. This is a satellite image. Um, I overlaid this. Uh, this is kind of the label for the image, which gives us the outline of the glacier that uh, some folks had. Uh, this is, you know, this is something that was decided where that boundary should go uh, by some glaciologists. I'm not sure how they did that actually, but so this is actually the thing we have to try to predict in the image. So much harder because we have to know where all these dots are, um, which is difficult. We can make it simpler actually. A lot of these dots are unnecessary because it's just a straight line connecting here. Avoid that. Um, so the data source that we have is a Landsat satellite. So this is a satellite that um, goes around the Earth. It captures the whole Earth every 17 days. And what it actually captures is not just pictures. Um, so it captures different wavelengths of the spectrum. So there's light that's not visible. So it'll try to collect um, infrared stuff or, or different types of infrared. So it'll get the red, green, and blue like we're used to seeing, but it's got much more layers to each image. So it's got a nice uh, resolution, 30 meters, uh, and it's got a nice time resolution. You get each picture of each location on Earth. You can get it every 17 days. So what we've started doing is trying to uh, pull all this stuff out and get all the glacier images we can and then get a time series of them. And so this is you know, an example. This is actually from the documentation for uh, Landsat's uh, Sentinel software. But this is a time lapse of uh, somewhere in the Caspian Sea. Uh, you can see. So we're trying to get a, those and then label where the glaciers are and then try to predict the motion of them again, like this. So uh, the data looks like this. So instead of just having the, uh, the uh, bounding box in blue here, we have to have this boundary, which means we have to have all these dots on the picture. And that's what we try to predict. So very common way to do a good algorithm is mask RCNN. So RCNN uh, is another method for object detection. And so it, that you only look once is called a single shot detector because it only has like one in piece of inference to it. With mask RCNN, it has two stages. And so what it does, it recommends a bunch of possible bounding boxes. And then there's a approach that tries to find what are the good ones that, that seem to be actual objects. And so it goes to a, another layer and then we do the classification. So if we were doing, you know, object detection, that would be all we do. But this has a whole other branch on it that specifically tries to identify each pixel, you know, which one goes with the person, which one doesn't. So that's the method we're using there. Uh, that's all I had. Sorry, I'm kind of rushing there at the end, but 
If anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm open. Yeah, this was this was uh, excellent. Um, uh, in fact, I I had known about some of these. Uh, I was before you went to your Kerbal, I had actually written down uh, how, are you using synthetic data to come up with uh, models, you know, in like Blender or, or Maya or something to go, hey, no, this, that, is that's, this is a satellite. That's at the top of our uh, list, really. We, we have right now our inference is not doing as good as we want. So we have a list that we came up with of about 30 different ideas to try. So our students and ourselves are going through and just, you know, what can we do that's really cheap to do? So like sometimes we're taking the bounding box and then running unsupervised learning on what's out of the box to try to do segmentation. Another thing is more data is generally good. We don't, we only have 2,500 images. So synthetic data is another thing we've been trying to think about. A lot of other things really. Then the other uh, question, just out of curiosity, is: uh, Has anyone, has anyone, have they started working on the, uh, the the physical problem of the Chase satellite itself? Like, is there anything out there that they're that they're? <laughs> well, like... our um, our team is me, which is oh, okay. <laughs> data science and an aerospace engineer named Marcus Wild, and another one named uh, Brian Kish. So they're actually working on as much as they can simulating what the docking would look like. And what they have is, it's kind of like an air hockey table, which is me saying it stupidly, but, but, but like they put these things on there and then they, they're, there's a small enough resistance that they can actually just put um, compressed air and just blow it out and oh, yeah. you know, drive the things. So they've been doing a lot. They, they figured out, you know, they can do some very precise movements. So what we need to do is Trying to tell them where to go without crashing into <laughs> things. <laughs> so this is that's an awesome problem. I mean, yeah, I hear a lot. Uh, you know, on some of these talks, you hear you hear what people are getting into. But yeah, the the concept of identifying because you could you could picture right. I mean, every every science fiction movie in the world has the oh yeah, that's that. Go up and grab it and then do something to it and manipulate. It. It's like. Yeah, to 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 work on that particular problem in, in yeah, for reals. I left out of, I left out the mathematical part of once we know where the things are, <laughs> how do we how do we build a model that's three D? But yeah, but we'll we'll figure that out. We we yes. promised the Air Force that we will. <laughs> that's spectacular. We'll see if it happens. What, what other questions do people have? We have uh, just just a couple minutes left, so let's open the floor. I'm good to stay as long as anyone has questions, honestly. But. Uh, yes, uh, so, so uh, great presentation, thank you. Um, I was wondering, you know, sort of along the lines of synthetic data, uh, what other sorts of strategies you might have for uh, doing data augmentation for the, the object det detection and the segmentation problems? Actually, we do a lot of data augmentation, which, which is more taking the data that we have and manipulating it. So instead of just passing each image through the model, very frequently we'll pass through each image rotated at, you know, 20 different angles. Mm -hmm. So it's the same picture going in, but we add more. And then we also do random cropping. So you take a, a random crop of the image, feed that in too. So we feed those in to, to just pretend like we have more data. Um, what do we do? We add um, noise, like a small amount of noise and feed those in. So, so we have a whole regime of different augmentations that we do to feed them in. Now, as far as totally synthetic data, I've not tried it. Um, some folks I know at NVIDIA really want to have us try out their, um, they have like a closed source SDK that tries to do synthetic data. But I, based on the methods that they use, which I think are generative adversarial networks, GANs, uh, I don't think we have enough data for that, but we're gonna try it and see. But that's the method that I'm most familiar with, uh, but I know there are a number out there and it's, it's a really quickly developing field. But I don't know, I've been told that I can use totally synthetic data to help, but I don't know if I believe it. I have a question about um, about uh, simplifying the problem so it can run on um, so it can run on a low power computer. Uh, basically, um, in theory, if uh, not all the data that you're 
not getting from the image is useful. In theory, you could get good results in image recognition and uh, maybe even segmentation if you reduce the image's resolution. Or yeah, if you um, convert you can... from monochrome. Is that, um, in practice, is that useful or are you losing too much data that way? We actually shrink it, shrink them all as far as we can until we see a drop off in performance. Sometimes we have to move it back up when we're testing different settings. Uh, but there's usually some cutoff, but if you make it too small, it's not going to work. But you can usually shrink, like some of these images are like, you know, a thousand by a thousand pixels. We're not feeding anything through here that's bigger than 500 by 500. And honestly, a lot of them, some experiments we did were only like 200 by 200 and it was fine. It didn't really have an effect. Um, and then broadly speaking, as many of those connections that we can take out of the model, the faster it'll run. So shrinking the image essentially just reduces the number of weights coming out of that first layer. So, you know, it, it definitely makes the thing run faster. And we've gone in and kind of stripped out as much as we can so much so that I think my student said, well, how do we know when it's still YOLO? Well, we started with YOLO, so it's it's YOLO. But uh, we've been going through doing that. Um, another thing that, that's really popular is uh, dimensionality reduction. A very common method is, is called uh, principal components analysis, although there, there are a number of others. Um, it's an option. Uh, I don't think we've tried it in this project, but a lot of times um, you can reduce all the images down to however many dimensions you need so that um, you preserve a certain percentage of the very information in the picture. So like you can say, you know, give me, you know, reduce it down to a format where I've got 99% uh, of the variation in the data and it may reduce the dimension as much as like, you know, 30, 40%. So that can, that can help. Um, that's, probably, that's that's on the list actually. Um, and then as much as we can, we've been trying to just shrink the, the number of layers. The, the layers help, but they're expensive. Uh, right now we get about, I think, six frames per second running the thing, which we'd like to get it to about, you know, about double that probably. A lot of trade-offs on, on that. Oh, I imagine. All right, so yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you for that answer. Problem. I want to uh, thank you for your time, Dr. White. I, this was this was great, um, and, and I mean, I love getting into the 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 sort of niches of someone's research and what they're really passionate about, and sort of what they're what they're working on and how they're thinking about solving the problems. And this this was uh, this was outstanding. I, we, we really appreciate you coming on and uh, and sharing with us. No problem. Thanks for coming, everyone.